I think that's everything. And today we're going to continue our, our new series for 2016 entitled Miracles Happen. Miracles Happen. And I'm going to open up, first of all, I'm going to read as my opening text from Psalm 77. And then we're going to head over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and chapter 4. So let me read from Psalm 77, verses 13 and 14. This is what uh, the psalmist wrote. He said, Your ways, O God, are holy. What God is so great as our God? You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. And then we turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And, and this is what the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians. He says, when I, when I came to you, brothers, I, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. That's, that's one of the reasons why we have a, an altar call where we, where we have people come down and we wait on the Lord because we need to see God's power in our lives. And then in, in chapter 4, uh, verse 20, the apostle says, For the kingdom of God, it is not a matter of talk, but of power. The kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. And so, Father, right now we come to you, and we ask you, Lord, to speak to our hearts, Lord, to open up our, our minds to, to hear you and to receive from you today. And, Lord, that you would change us by your power. It's not by might. It's not by my power, but it's by your spirit, says the Lord. And after the Holy Spirit comes upon you, Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, you shall receive power. Lord, we just look to you now, and we're asking you to have your way in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. And one of the things that we looked at last week, the first week we looked at God, that God's way is in holiness and that God's way is through the sea. God is holy and we're not. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so much higher are his ways and our ways and his thoughts and our thoughts. And so because he wants us to be holy like him. He brings us through the sea. And that means sometimes he brings us through hardship and difficulty, but he always brings us to the other side, and he always brings us to a place of prosperity. It may be difficult going through, but he always brings us through the sea. God's way is the way of holiness, and God's way is, is through the sea. And then we saw last week that Jesus was, when he was baptized, that the Holy Spirit came upon him. And then Acts chapter 10 says that God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he went around doing good and performing miracles. And then we saw from 2 Corinthians 1 verses 21 and 22 that Paul wrote, Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. So the same way that Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit and went around doing good, that God has anointed you and God has anointed me. He's put his spirit where? In our hearts. If we are believers in Jesus Christ, he has put his spirit in our hearts so that we too can walk in power, so that we too can overcome temptation when, when the enemy comes against us, so that we too can, have, can have, have power in our lives. This wasn't talking so much about salvation, but even Titus says, for the, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Amen. God's salvation has, has appeared to us, has come into our hearts. But what does it do? It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and to live and, and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this evil age. So God sent his son Jesus under this earth 
And, and we read in Philippians chapter 2 that when he came, what did he do? He emptied himself. He became nothing. What? He, he made it so that he was going to have to live his life on this earth the same way that we do. He was tempted in every way just as we are, yet he was without sin. How did he do it? He did it by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And then we read, you know, God has anointed us and given us his spirit. He's filled us with his spirit. His spirit lives inside of us so that we too can be overcomers. We only do it by the spirit of God. And there is this battle that we go through. There is this battle that we go through. And one of the purposes of God when he does miracles in our life, one of his, the purposes is, is so that we will be changed. So that we will see God for who he is. That he won't just be this idea or this thought that's out there. You see, because I thank God for the word and God does miracles through in my life. When I read his word, he's done. I might give you some examples today. But he, he does that so that we can know him. So that we can know, again, that it's more than just a great thought. So many people say Jesus was a prophet or a good man. He, Jesus is so much more than that. And maybe you've heard about him all of your life, but he has a, a greater experience for you that he wants to bring into your life. He has a greater power that he wants to bring into your life. Part of this power that we're talking about is a power to live a godly life. Try living a godly life in your own, and it, it's, almost, it's impossible. You can't do it. That's why he's given us of his spirit. That's why we need to lean completely on him. And that's why sometimes he does miracles. I, I, you know, when I read through the Bible, there are some, there are some things that, that confound me. Like, like, for instance, when I read in Deuteronomy chapter 29 and, and verses 1 through 4, l listen to what, 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 what was read there. It says, Paul, uh, Paul, <laughs> Moses, Moses is writing down these words for the children of Israel. And he says, these are the terms of the covenant the Lord commanded Moses to make with the Israelites in Moab in addition to the covenant he made with them at Horeb. Moses summoned all the Israelites and said to them, your eyes have seen all that the Lord did in Egypt to Pharaoh, to all his officials and to all his land. With your own eyes, you saw those great trials, those miraculous signs and, and great wonders. But to this day, the Lord has not given you a mind that understands or eyes that see or ears that hear. And the reason I'm reading this verse is, is I want to make it clear to you that miracles alone are not enough to change your heart. God did all those miracles in the children, for the children of Israel. And we're, we're praying, we're, this series is called Miracles Happen, and, and we've seen miracles happen. Let me just give you an example right now, little Shirley Campbell. We, we've been praying for her, and guess what? She, she, was, she was, her kidneys were, were gone, and she had to go on dialysis. Well, something happened to her that the doctors around here have said they've never seen happen before. Her kidneys began to work again, and she's no longer on dialysis. Now, why, how did that happen? That happened because of prayer. Yes. And, and we could go on and on with, with examples here. If I, if, I, if I had some of you stand up, and one of these days I'm going to have Gary give it a, a testimony and some others of you, if I had you stand up, we could go on and on and talk about miracles that God has done. But you see, a miracle that God has done is not enough to change our heart. It's how we respond to these miracles. In, in, in Matthew chapter 13, I, I, I was flabbergasted when, when I read this years ago, and I was, and I was asking myself this question. You know, why is it like this, Lord? If you read in verses 10 through 15, it says, The disciples came to him, to Jesus, and asked, Why do you speak to the people in parables? And he replied, The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. I would like to expound on that someday, but today's not that day. I'm going to keep going. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. This is from Isaiah chapter 6. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. 
For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears. They've closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. And I'm thinking to myself, what? He's, he's speaking to them in parables for the express purpose so that they can hear but not hear. I don't get it. There's a, there's a reason for it. See, what does Jeremiah 29 say? It was quoted today. It says, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with half of your heart. With all. With all your heart. And to seek God with all of your heart means something. To seek God with all of your heart means something. It means all. See, because there are so many things that are vying, that are fighting for our hearts. And, and, and when we give our heart to something else, there's a power there. Jesus said this, whoever sins becomes a captive to sin. Paul said the same thing. Whoever, Paul said whoever sins is a slave to sin. There's a power to that. And so the reason why Jesus spoke to them in parables was because he, was, he wants to draw us into a deeper place where we were going to seek him we're going to seek him with all of our heart but he also understands and knows that in that process there's something else that has to happen if we're going to seek him with all of our heart there has to be a breaking away of the idols and so when you read when you turn to psalm 115 it says this. This is just so powerful to me. We were in prayer on a, Wednesday, uh, a Friday night. I used to have prayer meeting on a Friday night when, we, and when I pastored in Revere. And we were in prayer on a Friday night. And I was, I, was, I, had, I was boggled. My brain was boggled about putting Deuteronomy 29 and Matthew 13 together. And I'm thinking, I don't get it, Lord. Why didn't you give them a heart and a mind to know and understand? Why, why would you speak to them in parables so that they could hear but not hear and see but not see? Why? You know how when we have prayer meeting here on Monday night, one of the things I always say is, if the Lord has given you a verse of scripture, just go ahead and read it out. If the Lord puts something on your heart to pray, just pray. And, and when we had the three nights of prayer, it was, it was just so awesome, especially on the Wednesday night. That something unique happened on that Wednesday night. There, there kept coming prayer meeting, a prayer requests, and, and this is what, what happened to me. I, th I think it was three or maybe four times this happened that night. Pastor, can I pray for that one? <laughs> Absolutely. Pastor, can I? It was like I didn't have to pray. Everybody wanted to pray. That's just an awesome thing. But you see, God's moving. What, what is it? What, what is the secret? Why is it that, that sometimes God will do a miracle in our lives and we just can't perceive it? We can't see it. We can't understand. Well, Psalm 115 has the key right here. It says, he says, not to us, O Lord. Not to us, but to your name be the glory. Because of your love and your, not to us, but to you, to your name be the glory. He says, why do the nations say, where is their God? People will oftentimes say to you, where, where is your God? Why do the nations say, where is your God? Our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases him. You can rest in that too because he can be fully trusted. It's not like if it said about you or I that we do whatever pleases us. Then be afraid. He does whatever pleases him. But their idols are silver and gold made by the hands of men. Now listen. They have mouths, 
but cannot speak. Eyes, but cannot see. They have ears, but cannot hear. Noses, but they cannot smell. They have hands, but they cannot feel. They have feet, but they cannot walk. Nor can they utter a sound with their throats. And then as Evelyn was reading this next verse, it was like a light came on in my mind. Those who make them will be like them. And so will all who trust in them. Those who make them will be like them. And so will all who trust in them. So go back to Deuteronomy chapter 29. Your eyes, your own eyes saw all this, but to this day the Lord has not given you a, a heart or a mind. Why? Because they made a golden calf. And they worshipped it. And so they became like it. They had eyes, but they couldn't see. They had ears, but they couldn't hear. They had mouths, but they couldn't speak. Hands, but they couldn't touch. Feet, but they couldn't walk. They became like the idol that they had made. And when there's idols in our lives, see, one of the reasons why God doesn't move in power more in our life is because you will search me and find me when you search for me with all, all your heart. And we come with half of our heart clinging on this other thing with everything within us. And when we say, like the psalmist said here, where's your God? Where's your God? You want to you wanna see God? Then, then give him all of your heart. I, I, I promise you, if you commit your way to him, if you allow God to move in your life, you will see him do miraculous things in your life. You will see the power of God in your life. You won't have to be listening to a story about how God moved in somebody else's life. You'll be telling your own story. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but it's power. God wants to move in power in your life. He wants to give you victory to overcome sin. He wants, he wants your testimony to be one of, you know, this is how I struggle, but now God is moving in my life, and, 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 and I'm walking in his power. Okay, now I have to get to my opening text. You see, because if you read through the Gospels, you'll find out that they're very similar in their stories. But in Luke chapter 5, Verses 1 through 11. There, there's a story that happens, and, 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 and it's, it's a miracle that happens in Peter's life. Now, some scholars link this with Mark chapter 1 and, and Matthew's uh, chapter, chapter 4 with the call of the disciples that took place there. But I, I believe that this is a subsequent call, that this is a second call to Peter. Because as you read through, through the gospel of, of Peter, we see, we saw that, of, of Peter, of Luke, <laughs> We saw what happened in Peter's life. We saw that uh, Jesus goes to his home in chapter 4, verse 38, and he, and he, he, he prays for his mother-in-law, and she's healed. Uh, we, we know because of Mark's gospel that, that Peter was, and also John's gospel, that Peter was one of the first ones called. Andrew, Peter's brother, was one of the first disciples of Jesus. John the Baptist had pointed <laughs> told him to follow him, and he went, he said, he ran and got his brother, brother Peter, his brother Simon. 
And that's when Jesus changed his name. So he was right there from the beginning. And so when the demon is cast out in, in chapter 4, verse 31, Peter's there. When his mother-in-law is, 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 is raised with a fever, Peter's there. When Jesus goes out, and when the sun is setting, and all, they, all the people were brought to Jesus, and all the miracles were happening, Je Jesus was, Peter was there, rather. He saw Jesus do all these healings. He saw him cast out the demon. He saw him raise up his mother-in-law from a, from, a, from a high fever. He's, he's, he's seen all these things. He's, he's already been called, and he's, and he's left his boat, and he started to follow Jesus, but you, but you know, he, he still doesn't know who Jesus really is. They're, they've already said he's the Messiah. They're, they're proclaiming, they're proclaiming him that. But God wanted to take him from a place of head knowledge to a place of heart knowledge, or what we could even call experiential knowledge, where he experiences firsthand that Jesus is more than just a man. And he has a power that is greater than anything that I've ever seen. And so there's a second call in Peter's life. And here we are in, in chapter 5. And, and let me read through it. And then I'll, I'll, get, I'll go where I can go. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Genesaret, or Genesaret with the people, that's also the Sea of Galilee. It's the same place. With the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God that Jesus is speaking. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put, excuse me, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. There's, there's a lot of power right there. Because you say so, I will let down the nets. Lord, help me. Okay, verse 6. When they had done so, when they, when they obeyed Jesus, even when everything within them told them, don't do it. I'm the fisherman. He's a carpenter. He doesn't know what he's talking about. We've been working hard all night. We're fishing. We know how to do this. You see, even when you've got all these objections to do what Jesus is asking you to do, if you obey, there's a miracle on the other side. That's why when Pastor Sam came forward this morning and, and gave a word, when you obey, there's a miracle on the other side. It might not be a dramatic miracle, it might just be power for your life to overcome whatever is in your life that you need. So, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. Now, you could say that that's just a, that could just be a natural phenomenon, not a supernatural one. But I'm telling you, that was a supernatural phenomenon. Anyway, here we go. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw this, now here it is. Here's, here's the thing. Simon Peter, who has been walking with Jesus, who has been seeing the things that Jesus has been doing, who's seen him cast out demons, who's seen him heal his mother-in-law, who's seen him heal all the sick people that came to him, who's seen the power in his life, who's seen him at this point turn water into wine, who's seen him do all of these things but he hasn't seen yet his eyes still were not opened see miracles can't change the heart but sometimes God does a miracle that if you if you see it just right it does a deeper work in you and and, and listen when Simon Peter saw this he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James of John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. Healing rain is, is falling down. Healing rain is falling down. I'm not afraid. He said to him, don't be afraid. You see, because here's the thing. When God really shows you who you are, fear comes in. 
fear comes in. When I was 19 years old, I wasn't living for the Lord. I've been raised Catholic, and I love the Lord with all of my heart when I was a little boy, but things happened in my life. My dad was in an accident when I was four years old. My mom got, he became a major alcoholic. He basically took his life when I was 16. My mom remarried an alcoholic who hated me. <laughs> life was good. And, uh, and I, I went in a wrong road. I began to, first it started with drinking, but when I found drugs, wow, that was way better than drinking. And so I got pretty heavy into drugs because I didn't have a hangover after that. And uh, I got kicked out of my house when I was 18. And I moved into a home in Wheaton, Illinois. Five of us teenagers had our own house. This, these kids, they had their own house, and we moved in. And one of them was a drug dealer, and that was awesome because I never had to pay a penny for anything except for my marijuana. I did pay for that. But anything else, you know, I mean, it's the other way around. I never paid a penny for marijuana. I always had to pay for the other stuff. <laughs> High every day for free. That was, a, that was a great life for a 19-year-old, you know, that didn't know the Lord, really. And then uh, one, one of the days, we, they, they, they gave me a drug that I'd never tried before. And, um, it was acid. And, um, wow, I loved it. And we were all there that day tripping on acid and uh, they had all been raised Baptist and I'd been raised Catholic and so they came to me and they said Michael let's talk about God okay I believe in God <laughs> that's cool <laughs> they said and it's like they all, like they, all of a sudden there was this crowd all around me and I was the focus I was the center of attention and they said to me, Michael, do you know that if you died today, you'd go to hell? <laughs> I said, what are you talking about? I'm a good person. And I began to argue with them. I'm a good person. God wouldn't send me to hell. And then they said this, if we die today, We'd go to hell too. What? See, because I believed in heaven and I believed in hell. And I thank God for my Catholic upbringing because it taught me these truths. And when they told me I was going to hell, I could fight that I'm a good person. But when they told me that they were going to hell and that they knew it, I was floored. So I ran to my bedroom. I didn't want to talk about God anymore. And I literally headed out with the Lord. And I was pounding and kicking and saying, why would you send me to hell? I'm a good person. And he just whispered, whispered into my ear a question. What are you doing right now? I'm tripping on acid. Is that good? No. And I knew it. I knew it right then and there. 
that if I didn't change, that I was going to hell. God doesn't leave us in a place like that. Even though I lived in Wheaton, Illinois, and had gone to Wheaton Warrenville High School, which is, I don't know if any of you know about Wheaton, Illinois, Wheaton College, and so many Christian organizations are there, and I'd have to say that probably 75% of my school was, was Christians. I'd never been witness to. No one had ever really told me about a, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and that he could come and live inside of me, that I needed to repent of my sins. And, but from that day on, everywhere I met, I ran into Christians. Everywhere I went, a student from Wheaton, Wheaton College was walking by and said, stopped. I was working at Gary Wheaton Bank. I was working in maintenance and I was weeding. I was picking, picking weeds and he stopped and he came to me and says, I just feel like I need to talk to you about Jesus. You do? <laughs> New landscapers came to the bank and they said, would you like to go to a Bible study? Yes. And slowly but surely, I started to yield to the Lord. But I was still struggling. I had a major struggle with marijuana. I just could not stop it. I could not stop smoking marijuana. It just, it was like they say, that back then they told us that was the one that wasn't addictive. I had no problem drop, stopping everything else. But I just was struggling with, in this battle with, with marijuana. And with serving the Lord because it was foreign to me. I didn't really know anything about it. So God, God called me, but then there was, a, there was another call where God did something in my life that was a little bit above the ordinary. And I was, I'm going to ask the worship team to come up right now, actually. <laughs> I realize I'm, I'm not over time yet. Don't panic. Zeros are at 440, so I got f a couple more hours to go. I'm only kidding. But this is what happened. You see, and this is what happened to Peter. The Lord had been speaking to me, and I knew that I wanted to serve the Lord, and I'd, and I'd seen God already do things in my life at this point. My eyes had really become open to the fact of, of where I was really going, and I, and I did yield my life to Jesus Christ, but God wanted more for me, and I want you to know that God wants more for you, just like he wanted more for Peter. God wants more for you. And so the woman who actually led me to the Lord went to a church that wasn't a Catholic church, and that was a really hard thing for me, a very hard thing for me. And she kept inviting me to church, and I kept saying, I'll go, and I just never went. And one day, a couple of the, the guys from that church got together with me, at, and, and they, wanted to, they wanted to pray for me. And they, they took me through the Bible. And they showed me in the Psalms about worship and what worship was all about and how the Psalms tell us to, to clap your hands, all you people, to shout unto God with a voice of praise, to lift up your hands in the sanctuary, that all this was part of worship. And then we didn't need to be afraid of those things. They took me to all the places in the, in the Bible where it talked about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and all of those things. And they showed me in the Bible where, where men were baptized with the Holy Spirit. And they prayed for me to receive the Holy Spirit. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. I went home that night and I had a dream. And in my dreams, I, I began to speak in other tongues in my dreams. But what happened the next day is really what I want to talk to you about. Now see, now, now that would have, would have really, really scared me except for the fact that they showed me in the Bible where it was. If it's not in the Bible, run from it. But they showed me in the Bible all the verses in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 8, 9, and 10, and 11, and in 19, and 
1 Corinthians 12 through 14 and some of the other places. So then I go to church the next day. My first time ever in a church that isn't a Catholic church. First time ever. And I go in there. And to my surprise, there's drums. I'm going, huh? In church? There's a bass player. There's a guitar player and another guitar player. And there's a piano player. And they begin to sing songs like I'd never heard before in a church. And I'm thinking, what is going on here? And not only that, but everyone is singing and clapping in church. And I'm floored. I'm like, <laughs> what is happening here? So I'm trying, you know, to, to, to fit in, but I, I'm not, you can't expect me to sing out loud with people right next to me. I was sitting in a chair just like this one. Actually, at that point, I was standing, and there was, and I am like floored. But here's the thing. The night before, I saw all of this in the scriptures. They showed me all the places in the scriptures where it talked about these very things, you know, about praising the Lord with the cymbals and the tambourine and the harp and the lyre and dancing before the Lord. You know, they showed me all of these things. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, all right, think for a minute. Okay, I saw all this in the Word of God. Okay, okay, okay. I started to feel a little bit better. But then I, then I realized, I said, God, Lord, you cannot expect me to do this. I cannot do this. I can't clap my hands in church. I can't raise my hands. I can't sing out loud. Someone might hear me. I cannot do this, Lord. I know it was in your word. I, I, I know they showed it to me, but I cannot do this. And all of a sudden, someone begins to speak real loud in a language that I do not know. And everything stops. Everything. No guitar, no drums, no piano, no singing. Just a voice that I am freaked out. Everyone's head is down, and my head is like... What is happening here? And then the voice stops. And everybody's waiting. And then all of a sudden, the interpretation comes. Do not say, I cannot do this. For I will be with you. And let me tell you, the exact same thing that happened to Peter happened to me. I fell. I literally fell into my chair. It says that Peter fell at Jesus' feet. And he said, depart from me. I'm a sinful man, oh God. I fell and I began to weep uncontrollably because God spoke right to me. And what was he saying? Do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. Do not be afraid. What are you afraid of this morning? What are you afraid of? What about serving Jesus makes you afraid? Today, 
His healing rain has fallen down. And you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid. Seek God. Listen, if you want to hear from God, then get rid of the idols in your life. It may sound hard, but it's really not. It's just an act of surrender. Get rid of the idols in your life and let God speak to you and watch what God will do. He wants to reveal himself to you today. Maybe you can say, you know, I've never sensed God in that way before. Well, God is no respecter of persons. He wants you. See, what happened was a, was a time of breaking. Put up Isaiah 57 real quick on the board. Do we have it? There it is. It says, and it will be said, build up, build up, prepare the road. Remove the obstacles out of the way of my people. That would be the idols. It says, for this is what the high and exalted one says, he who lives forever, whose name is holy. I live in a high and a holy place, but also with him who is contrite and lowly in spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive. The, you see, you, if, if you want a miracle to make a difference in your life, it has to be mixed with humility. He says, if, if, if humility is not mixed in with the miracle, you want to know what happens? You become proud and think that there's, you're something and you become a Pharisee. But when you mix it with humility, I live in a high and holy place, but also with him who is contrite and lowly in spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly, to revive the heart of the contrite. Now go to Isaiah 66, verses 1 and 2. It says, this is what the Lord says. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house you will build for me? Where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all of these things? And so they came into being, declares the Lord. This is the one. Or these are the ones. <laughs> this is the, the new NIV. Sorry, I have the old NIV. I prefer it. These are the ones I look on with favor. Those who are humble and contrite in spirit and who tremble at my word. Who tremble at my word. So let's humble ourselves this morning. As we sing this song, Healing Rain is Falling Down, I know that God wants to move miraculously in your life. One of the things you might be afraid of is coming to the altar. Why do we do that? It's an act of faith on your part. It's an act of faith. It's, it's, it's like taking a step of faith. Oftentimes God says, he wants us to step out in faith. He said to Abraham, Abraham, go to the place that I will show you. If he didn't move, then God doesn't do anything. When you move, sometimes when you move, when you take a step, God does something in your life. Maybe you're not ready for that step, but maybe today God is saying, I want you to step out. I want you to go up to the altar. And it, it's not about anyone laying hands on you or praying for you. It's just about you getting with Jesus and letting that healing rain fall on you and, and, and taking all that fear out of your life. You, you, you don't need to be afraid. You don't need to be afraid. So healing rain is falling down. Healing rain is falling down, and I'm not afraid. And as, if the Lord is, let's, let's all stand to our feet right now, and if the Lord is speaking to your heart in any way today, and, he's, and, and if any way you're thinking, uh, maybe, I, 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 maybe I should go to the altar, don't be afraid today. Just go to the altar. No one's thinking anything about you. It's a place where God can begin to do miracles in your life. That's what this place is. It's a place where God can begin to, to, to break strongholds in your life. Let's sing that. The altars are open. <laughs>